Most of this episode was put together before I heard the news of Her Majesty the Queen's passing. Now, as a podcast, of course, rather than broadcast media, we aren't bound by the various codes of conduct that need to be adhered to. And by the way, didn't they do marvellously? Television, radio, from Hugh Edwards' measured and often improvisational tone as he kept on air for several days straight to the light pop music of choice on the commercial and music stations. But anyway, I still wanted to doff my cap to our dear Queen because it gives us a chance on this podcast... This is the BBC Home Service. While we dwell in World War II broadcasting, as we have been for a couple of episodes... Hello, children everywhere. ...to play you this. This is one of the most important days in the history of children's hours. From 1940. Today, Princess Elizabeth is herself to take part in the Children's Hour and speak to the children of the Empire at home and overseas. Princess Elizabeth, as she was then, aged 14. In wishing you all good evening, I feel that I am speaking to friends and companions who have shared with my sister and myself many a happy Children's Hour. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your homes and be separated from your fathers and mothers. My sister Margaret Rose and I feel so much for you as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. We know, every one of us, that in the end all will be well for God will care for us and give us victory and peace. And when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. For the full clip, see the link in our show notes and expect to hear a little more of the most broadcast monarch in British history, perhaps in the world. I need to check that out. In a a couple of episodes time, we'll be exploring 100 years of British broadcasting in 100 minutes. And I'm pretty sure that that would include some of Queen Elizabeth II. My sister is by my side and we are both going to say goodnight to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, And good luck to you all. And if I may be allowed, I would like to say what is in the minds of all the children listening. Thank you, Princess Elizabeth, very much for broadcasting in the children's hour. And I'm fresh back from the Isle of Wight, where I performed my show, The First Broadcast. I was hosted there by a voice you will hear on this episode of the podcast, Tim Wonder. And as part of that performance, which took place very soon after the news of the monarchical handover, I always include in the first broadcast this little burst of broadcasting history. Dame Nellie Melba, who on June the 15th, 1920, sang a song that had a more resonant significance to it when we did it last week. God Save the King. back to World War II broadcasting for this episode, which features more from Edward Sturton, who you heard last episode on Auntie's War, and Tim Wonder, the Marconi historian, because it turns out that it's that man yet again, Peter Eckersley, the chief engineer of the BBC, and the wild engineer who propelled the first broadcasts of 1922. Yes, Eckersley finds his way into this story of radio in World War II, ultimately leading to this tale of radio as propaganda. Here, on what I suppose is the first episode of the Carolean era of the British broadcasting century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. Well, hello, hello, welcome to the podcast. Paul Carenza here, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the uh, fourth of our three specials. That's awkward. Edward Sturton on Auntie's War was last episode, and this supplementary episode is an extra, really. I was going to include it in last episode, but this is slightly separate from Auntie Beeb's story. This is the tale of radio as propaganda in World War II, the unofficial broadcasting stations that certainly weren't the BBC. Yes, deceit on the airwaves, but did it help us win the war? Well, it's all a bit of a grey area, this white propaganda and black propaganda. This episode really is about the black propaganda, that is, propaganda that hides its origins. So this episode, what you would hear on your radios in unofficial broadcasting in the early 1940s. Expect more from Edward Sturton and from Tim Wonder. But do you believe what you hear? Joseph Goebbels 
starts to use radio as it's never been used before. Author of the book 2MT Riddle, Tim Wonder. He will use radio between 35 and 38 to essentially enslave a population. 80 million people listen to the National Socialism, Socialism radio sets on people sets that are given to them for free or for a very small stipend. They can rent them over years. Made of Bakelite, they've got the, the German Eagle and the Swastika on the, on the later versions. They can only hear that German station. They can't hear anything from overseas. He is able to, with doctrine and speeches and continual propaganda, drive Germany into what we become the Second World War. This from the 1939 book, Propaganda, by R.S. Lambert. Totalitarian states strengthen their propagandist use of radio by providing cheap standard receiving sets capable of hearing only the home programme by installing loudspeakers at street corners and in public places and by exerting pressure upon the public to listen on all occasions when the broadcast programme is used for the exposition of national policy. In Germany, it has even been legally laid down that it is part of the duty of the citizen to possess a wireless set and to listen to the programmes his government provides. This is the tale of misleading broadcasting in World War II. Dastardly or heroic or conniving or deceitful or war-winning all depends on your angle, of course. But it's also the tale of a familiar name on this podcast. A name that appears in the book, which is a name that we featured a lot on the podcast, that's Peter Eckersley. Um, Oh, yeah. Author of Auntie's War, Edward Sturton. Chief engineer of the BBC and the first Britain's first sort of ma- major regular broadcast in many ways. And then he'd left the BBC by this point. But then it was his wife, Dorothy, wasn't it? I think who helped with the Lord Haw Haw. Yes. <laughs> and of course, he, he left the BBC, didn't he? Because he would got divorced. Mm. And uh, Lord Reith did not approve of that kind of thing at all. Let's consider Peter Eckersley's role and what he was up to at this point in World War II. Now, if you've listened to the full works of this podcast, and if you haven't, why not, may I ask? You can go back and discover our 50-plus episodes thus far. Uh, Peter Eckersley first came into our uh, awareness, I suppose, on this story when he was doing the experimental broadcasts in 1922 from Rittle in Essex. He was this wild, crazy, kind of Kenny Everett of his day, doing the goon show several decades decades before there were goons and then he became chief engineer of the BBC which is really where we left him in our regular podcast timeline February 1923 he's just been hired by John Reith. Now to fill in a large gap then he then developed so much of BBC engineering in the first uh, five to ten years including the regional program uh, the first long wave transmitter in the world from Daventry Daventry calling all of that to come but then he leaves the BBC under a cloud due to an affair and then a divorce. Now the woman that he remarried was Dorothy Clark. Uh, We'll tell the story uh, on a future episode but essentially she was uh, the wife of another BBC employee Edward Clark, who's all about music. And Dorothy led Peter down a little road, it's fair to say, in the 1930s. That road was Oswald Mosley, fascism. And yes, he did realise the error of his ways, I think, in time, but not before he'd been to Europe and helped build a radio station for, well, what would become the enemy to Britain. Tim Wonder on what Peter Eckersley was up to in the lead up to the Second World War. Because this period in the 1930s becomes extremely fascinating and there is still a lot of research to do so Eckersley uh and his new wife Dorothy Eckersley which which was the cause of his divorce and the um is leaving the BBC though again I suspect Eckersley's time at the BBC was actually done Mm. and this was simply an excuse Eckersley had grown again to be an incredibly important and powerful and well-known feature and many articles you can see the expert on radio And some of the BBC board weren't happy about this cult of celebrity. He also was exuding huge amount of power. And he was also, without getting into detail, he was also Peter Eckersley. Mm. So I think as he comes out and he marries Dorothy, so Dorothy becomes part of the, let me call them the 1930 sets, the Mitford sisters, and Oswald Mosley. The story is fascinating. But I know in early uh, November 1931, Eckersley briefly considers politics, maybe chairman of London Central Committee under Oswald Mosley. Loads of familiar names like Harold Nicholson's there, hub, husband of Vita Sackville West, Lord Northcliffe and Lord Beaverbrook are backing it. At that point, it's a response to, to communism. We now see Oswald Mosley as a fascist in the black shirts. In 1932, he was very nearly our prime minister. 
uh, Dorothy Eckersley is sucked into this world through her friendship with his wife and her people. Uh, and Eckersley essentially goes along for the ride. They go over to Germany and Peter Eckersley needs a job. He's broke. The Germans are about to build the biggest radio network in the history of the world. And they look towards the man who'd done it before. One of the things that was interesting is during the 30s, I believe that the Germans looked towards Eckersley to develop their, let's call it black propaganda network, um, which will never actually develop as, as I think they want it, because Goebbels will hold the Reich's ministry with a huge power and relies on dominating his people um, with uh, control and, and whatever tactics he can come up with. During 36 and 37, Eckersley is courted by the Nazi regime to become the chief engineer of these enormous stations at um, Naun, or Naun and, and Reims to broadcast to the German people, but also to turn it around because the German, uh, the German hierarchy decided that it was time to broadcast pro uh, propaganda to England and to the rest of Europe. Eckersley never takes that um, silver fenning, if that's the right phrase. Um, what we're now clear is that during this period in time, um, we're still waiting on freedom of information requests, but um, it's now quite clear that Eckersley is working for, I guess what you'd then call the Secret Intelligence Service, SIS, but what we now know is MI5. He's also recruited by a gentleman called Maxwell Knight, who shares an office just across the corridor from a gentleman called Ian Fleming. Fleming will go on to um, write James Bond, as you'll read really know, and of course, Maxwell Knight is M. Cool. So Eckersley descends into a world of spies because he then becomes the lone voice. His wife has taken the silver spinning. She's going to join the German broadcasting network, broadcasting in English. He's reporting back almost weekly that this station is growing, that with his radio sets, that he can control the nation and the BBC does nothing. At some point, clearly, his wife goes one way and then there must be a moment. I don't know if we quite know when that moment was or, or what the spark was or, or a growing sense. One of the things, he hated authority. <laughs> that got into a world of trouble at Mark a world of trouble at the BBC. But more, and he writes several times, he hated bullies. He really did not like anybody inflicting their will on anybody else. Eckersley will come to a, a position whereby he really cannot look away as we go into Crystal Knack and the and the uh, persecution of the Jews and the other uh, the other parts of the German social structure that are not to the Aryan liking. And I think the is, is that by 38, Eckersley is basically on his way home. We're not exactly sure when he comes home. There was, there are several oblique references to his having to escape because obviously now he's been privy to everything the Germans have in terms of their transmitter, their frequencies, the whole nine yards. Uh, and the view was the Gestapo really didn't want him to go. He comes back to England. Um, he is debriefed extensively. We actually know where in London. And of course, Eckersley can't get a job. His security clearance is revoked. He loses everything uh, and he writes his book in 41. It doesn't sell particularly well. And we know in 41, he comes very close to committing suicide. Um, it is really a, a sad end to this absolutely stellar and meteorotic and history-making career. His wife is now going to join and become the main broadcaster through 1940 and will actually recruit Lord Haw Haw. Edward Sturton. Joyce was his name. He wasn't really called Horvath. Mm. Very effective broadcaster, particularly in the way he picked up on social divisions uh, in the United Kingdom, which really worried the authorities. Um, he also had this strange ability to create myths about himself that weren't really true. People thought that he could tell you in his broadcast whether a particular cl church clock in a village in Bedfordshire was running a bit slow which there's no evidence he actually could. I mean, he yeah. simply read the papers carefully yeah. and fed stuff back over the airwaves in a way that made people think he had an inside track. There's a story of a high court judge I found who'd taken one of his BBC mates out to lunch and said he'd heard that um, Hall had been talking about him specifically. He'd like to see a transcript from the BBC monitoring service. And 
note back to him saying, well, we've looked everywhere, but I don't know where you heard this, but it simply isn't true. You never, you never mentioned your name. Um, but it had, a, it had a, an unsettling effect on people. Of course, Lord Haw Haw, um, it has to be done in English for the first year, Dorothy Eckersley, and, and another 20 British or American subjects who worked for that agency are going to transmit back. But from the way I, I've researched and looked at it is that their broadcast back to England actually become quite popular, but are almost uh, laughable. Uh, of course, he came to a very sticky end. His last broadcast um, from Germany before he fled um, at the end of the war, he's clearly completely drunk. This evening, I am talking to you about Germany. It's full of weird intonations and so forth. That is a concept that many of you may have failed to understand. And he then went off to the Baltic Sea, um, was eventually arrested by the Brits and, of course, hanged as a traitor. Now, as you may know, we have many books that have been gathered in the British Broadcasting Century bookshelves, which is where you find me now. I'm currently gawping at, uh, uh, we've got about a couple of dozen BBC yearbooks here. Uh, we've got uh, Edward Sturton's book, Auntie's War, glaring out at me. And an interesting book here that it took me a while to find uh, by R.S. Lambert. Now, Richard Lambert joined the BBC in 1927 as head of the adult education section before becoming the founding editor of The Listener magazine, which uh, you may recall, it was uh, almost a companion piece to radio in a way that the Radio Timers wasn't quite. It's more the written up versions of talks that you might have heard on the radio. A marvellous book called Ariel and All His Quality as well, which is very hard to find. And in 1939, as he left the BBC for Canada, in fact, CBC Radio, and that's when he wrote the book that I have in front of me here, Propaganda by R.S. Lambert. Under the British system of broadcasting, direct and intentional propaganda is excluded from the programmes, except in certain specific and limited cases where it's arranged by agreement. The most obvious of these cases is the allocation of time to addresses by the leaders of the principal parties at election time. Certainly, in times of intense partisanship, as during the general strike of 1926 or the election of 1931, loud complaints of partiality are heard. And these complaints are liable to crop up whenever a misunderstanding or mistake occurs. But as long as they occur in equal proportions from opposing sides, they seem to cancel each other out and leave a residual impression of fairness. Another kind of agreed propaganda is the Sunday evening appeal for good causes. Here the speakers are trying to attract subscriptions to charities and social services. Though their pleas for these movements are propagandist, the propaganda is disinterested and public-spirited. It is akin to another sort of propaganda which appears from time to time in the programmes, appeals at the end of the news for public tidiness, good manners, or safe driving at bank holidays, appeals for the preservation of the countryside, or for funds to acquire a national treasure, such as the Codex Sinaiticus, and warnings of various sorts against epidemics, cattle diseases, storms, and mishaps of various kinds. It remains then true to say that wireless in this country is used for direct propaganda only when there is general agreement that it is for the good of the community, and not just because it is the wish of the government of the day. More from Lambert's book later, but radio propaganda isn't all as pleasant as advice on bank holiday driving. Here's Tim Wanda with stories of black propaganda in World War II. The story changes in, well, 41, with an amazing character called Sefton Delmer. Now, your listeners won't have heard of Sefton Delmer. I think he is one of, he's another Eckersley. Right. He is a German Jew. He's escaped the Nazi regime. He actually had breakfast with Hitler. He actually knew them very well. He was a journalist and then had to get out of town very quickly for obvious reasons. Um, he will build during the Second World War what will loosely be called the British Black Propaganda Radio Broadcasts. Suffice to say, by 1942, Delma has set up a series of broadcast radio stations transmitting across occupied Europe. Most of the German French armed forces for the Germans don't realise that they're not German stations. The one called Soldicha, I can't, Calais Soldier, I can't do the German. There's another one. Um, there's another one which is broadcasting called um, uh, Atlantic Station, which is broadcasting to the France and to the U-boats. becomes incredibly popular. It's the only station listened to. They employ uh, a French lady 
to become the broadcaster. She is German, speaks German. They managed to, the RAF fly in the best records via Sweden. So they're playing jazz and all the things in the 1930s, which the Germans are not allowed to listen to. So these stations are very powerful. But what Sefton Delmer does with his strange, I'm going to say warped mind, is drip, drip, drip. Here's some examples. So they're broadcasting just ordinary news. And he then says, oh, here's a note to all the people in Munich, 50 Fennec notes. Last night, the, uh, the, the British terror bombers dropped thousands of fake ones. If you have to 50 Fennec, a 50 Fennec note, the Gestapo will arrest you. Take them outside and burn them now. And thousands of people do it. Wow. The power he exerts, he basically caused the Siemens factory to go on strike for a week because he announced, well done, Section 2B who do the chairs for armoured vehicles, are getting a pay rise. It's well-deserved. And nobody else in the factory got a pay rise. And they go on strike. So he has, and they sit around, they call it the, 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 the think tank, just, and it gets wilder and wilder and wilder. And, of course, one of the secrets is that he sets up two miles down the road from Bletchley Park. So he's able to target specific Germans, mid-ranking, mayors, and literally destroy their lives. One night, Vicky, with an eye, who's the lovely French lady, she was actually a French film actress, quite well known. She broadcasts, she sends out congratulations on the Atlantic Channel to a, a German U commander on the birth of twins. Well done. Bletchley Park had actually let her know that he'd been at sea for 10 months. Ah. He surrenders his submarine off the coast of Scotland a week later. And it gets worse. Some of the things they got up to, I can't actually put out on your podcast, but it, it turns the screw continually. Edward Sturton. There was a huge black propaganda effort that suggested they were actually being broadcast from within Germany, which sounded perfectly credible and would laud the Fuhrer and great German victories. And then suddenly they'd slip in an item which said something like, um, we congratulate the German, the great Reich's great doctors on having controlled the severity of the cholera outbreak in children's camps. And it was, we didn't know there was a cholera. Well, there wasn't, you know, we, we, we'd made it up and we just fed in that that kind of thing. Now, one of those holed up at Woburn Abbey, just down the road from Bletchley Park, sending radio messages into Germany and occupied territory is Hilda Matheson. Yes, her from two episodes ago, our first director of talks at the BBC, creator of speech radio as we know it today, creator of of The Week in Westminster, as well as many other programmes. She left the BBC in the early 1930s, became a radio critic, and she then became director of the JBC, the Joint Broadcasting Committee. Now, that was formed in 1937. Alas, she did not survive to see the end of the war after an illness in 1940. Look online, you won't find much about the JBC. There's not a lot written about it, even now. I think that's because its true aims and methods were a little hush-hush. It seems that what they would do is find native speakers from the occupied nations and get them to broadcast from Woburn Abbey. And these broadcasts would reach people in France and Poland across Europe in the languages of those occupied territories. So people would hear messages of hope and optimism and encouragement in their own language sent from Britain while their own countries were Nazi-run. On the surface... These seem to be positive messages of encouragement sent into these nations. In the mix, of course, you also have hidden messages to resistance fighters, for example. Elsewhere, you've got those more conniving broadcasts that seek to discredit and discourage the enemy, as you've heard from Edward Sturton and Tim Wonder. Elsewhere still, you've got propaganda sent out from Germany back into the UK from Lord Haw Haw, William Joyce, uh, Dorothy Eckersley and various others. So all different flavours, then, of what radio propaganda could look like. So as for the JBC, then, the Joint Broadcasting Committee, Hilda Matheson is running the show with Guy Burgess, her assistant at the BBC. They've now left the BBC. Famously, of course, Guy Burgess later ran off to join the KGB. Hilda, by the by, had a fling with Vita Sackville-West. Guy Burgess had a fling with Vita's husband, Harold Nicholson. And Harold Nicholson's radio broadcast was the reason that Hilda Matheson left the BBC in the first place back in the early 30s when he was banned by Reith for talking about modern literature. So isn't it crazy? These same names reoccur and reoccur, bump into each other even outside of the BBC. 
Not only that, but for a while, when not at Woburn Abbey, the JBC was operating from the Sussex home of Roger Eckersley, Peter Eckersley's brother. Roger had been director of programmes at the BBC, working alongside Hilda Matheson. So you can see then, I'm sure, why I was drawn to write a novel about all of this, which I'm still working on. The tales, the characters, they are too good to be true. But is it true? Well, yes, yes, it is. Sometimes you should believe what you hear. That was certainly going on all the time, as indeed was the use of the BBC to transmit uh, military instructions to resistance movements, particularly in France. So you might be listening to the personal messages, and most of them would be perfectly, uh, as you know, from French people who'd been left caught here after the fall of France and were trying to get messages back to their family. Most of them would be perfectly benign. And then there'd be um, something peculiar, like the crab has had snakes for breakfast. Well, what it meant was that, you know, such and such a resistance unit down near Lyon should go and blow up a bridge that afternoon. And so there was a lot of that going on as well. Um, and sometimes that, 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 towards the end of the war, that became so intense that the BBC was finding it had no room to get its news bulletins out. And there was a huge rise going on between the spooks and the broadcast. But I think alongside all that was the lesson that in the long term, um, telling the truth builds you a constituency which can be immensely valuable. And that if you're caught lying, you have your, 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 the trust undermined. And, and the Brits used to do that quite deliberately. For example, storing up Hitler's speeches. And if he'd say, I don't know, in the spring of 1940, we'll be in, we'll be in, uh, in London by next October. Come next October, they'd play the speech broadcast it to Germany and said, well, you're not here yet, are you? Um, in the hope that that would undermine people's trust in Germany. And conversely, um, they used it at home uh, so that so that people didn't believe what the government was, was telling them if it was broadcast on the BBC. Of course, it's much easier to tell the truth when you're winning. And um, there is a kicker in this tale a minute that as we get to 1943 and we realise that we're going to have to go back to Europe to throw the Nazis out of Europe, there's a uh, Operation Bodyguard and a whole series of operations, which is the, the trying to convince the Germans, the Nazis, that we're coming to the Pas de Calais and not Normandy. Massive uh, subterfuge and black operations all run out of the um, Milton Keynes, the black propaganda ar uh, arm around uh, Bletchley. Now, I was researching this and I caught a reference to the chief engineer who had actually got to go to one of these stations to fix it and guess what his name was Peter Eckersley really he comes back so again. I have now been researching this we found him elsewhere sadly annoyingly an awful lot of this is still buried under the hundred year rule but I believe there is another chapter in Eckersley's story <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Tim's marvellous books include From Marconi to Melba and To M.T. Rittle. While Edward Sturton's book, of course, is Auntie's War. Slight tangent. Did you see the prom from Public Service Broadcasting? Titled This New Noise, it was an album-length performance at the Albert Hall. If you haven't caught it, it's on iPlayer. This New Noise, the words that Hilda Matheson used to describe radio in her book Broadcasting. And it was voiced by Rita Chakrabarty. And also, if you listen carefully to the prom, at the very start, you'd hear archive clips of Peter Eckersley and Arthur Burroughs, two names very familiar on this podcast. So there you go. If you thought you would go this centenary year without hearing Eckersley or Burroughs on the BBC, maybe that was the chance you had. The Prom from Public Service Broadcasting. Catch it on iPlayer for the visual version or on BBC Sounds for the audio version. Oh, well, this podcast, by the way, is nothing to do with the BBC, even though I'm championing them and telling you where to go and find things about the BBC on the BBC. A final piece from R.S. Lambert's book Propaganda, written in 1939, just before World War II began, but with a prescient message, perhaps, for the future of broadcast propaganda, which, let's face it, is far from behind us. His final chapter is called Antidotes to Propaganda. The question of propaganda, Dr Goebbels has laid it down, is not whether it is on the right level, but whether it attains its end. And Hitler himself in Mein Kampf has claimed that by skilful and sustained use of propaganda, one can make a people see even heaven as hell or a most wretched life as paradise. The most powerful prophylactic against propaganda is tradition in a community, or habit 
in an individual. This is proved by the fact that it is during periods when traditions have broken down, e.g. during wars, revolutions or economic crises, that propaganda becomes most prevalent and most powerful. Propaganda, indeed, is a kind of substitute for tradition. Most ordinary people do not order their lives according to reason, but according to habit. Similarly, they found most of their opinions upon tradition, upon what is handed down to them by their family, their class, their government. Remove or interrupt these habits and traditions, and they do not revert to a process of pure rationality. They fall victims to another non-rational process of reaching decisions, i.e. propaganda. That propaganda will increase in the future, it is hard to doubt. The totalitarian governments that have intensified its use are forcing other governments, though more democratic, to imitate them. We are now witnessing a propaganda race as a supplement to the armaments race between the nations of the world. Every means by which man communicates with man is being pressed into service, and the race has no end. If totalitarian principles were to succeed in dominating the world, we should see the spectacle of self-contained national communities whose minds were ruled by emotion, directed by a few professional propagandists, and unchecked by the free flow of information and criticism, save in technological and scientific matters. The only hope would then lie in the gradual emergence of new traditions, which, however mistakenly founded, might offer some protection by virtue of their stability against the perpetual changes and uncertainty which propaganda brings about. In a stable world, however brought about, the floods of propaganda must find their own level and gradually subside. R.S. Lambert's argument there that tradition may be the only way to counter propaganda. We look back to what we've learnt before and wonder how that holds up against what the government of the day are telling us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Edward Sturton and to Tim Wonder. Buy their books, Auntie's War, uh, 2MT Riddle, and many others as well. Look out for them. Look out for my book as well, Auntie and Uncles, out at some point. Instead, for now, may I recommend my book on the history of Christmas called Hark the Biography of Christmas, available where you get books, and link is in the show notes to this and all of the books featured by all of these marvellous authors. Next time on the podcast, much as I was going to be diving back into our 1923 timeline for a couple of episodes, we'll look at the time. I don't think we can do that because it's nearly the BBC centenary itself. In October 1922, the BBC was formed. In November, November the 14th, came that first BBC broadcast. So that's what I'm working towards as the actual centenary, I think. And so around then, I'm going to bring you a couple of special episodes. A hundred years in a hundred minutes. That's the plan. It's quite ambitious. Let's hope we can get there. And I really hope that you'll get involved in that. Do get your voice on the podcast. Email me a voice clip of you waxing lyrical about a key moment from British broadcasting. Not just the BBC, of course, but commercial radio, commercial TV. Any landmark, you talk about it for even 20 seconds would be fine. Send me a clip to paul at paulcarenza.com link in the show notes and i will slot your voice into our hundred year celebration episode this uh, october or november so my plan is this right next time i'm plotting a special episode on events that you can go to so my guests will be lewis pollard uh, who's the curator at bradford science and media museum they've got an exhibition called switched on and loads of fantastic and fascinating bbc props and technology and old microphones that's up in bradford i'm going very soon I can't wait. It's going to be marvellous. There's a big symposium as well of BBC-type um, academics and historians, and I'll be there doing my first broadcast show, which has its last few tour dates. So if you want to come to the first broadcast, see me on tour by all means. Also, next episode then, be chatting to Bob Richardson. He's curated A Kingdom of Cardboard, props and idents and things that he's rescued from skips at the BBC over several decades. That exhibition is at St Bride's in London. Well worth a visit. I've been you'll love it. You can hear all about these exhibitions on the next episode. And if you have anything planned yourself or know anything that in some way commemorates 100 years of British broadcasting, email me, paul at paulcrenza.com, and I'll mention it next episode. But be quick, that next episode will be very soon. I'd love to know also what else you would like to hear on the podcast. Uh, my plan is this exhibition special in September, 100 years and 100 minutes episodes in October, November. And then I'm thinking maybe a roundup episode might be nice. What do you think? Reviewing the various uh, BBC 100 programmes, you know, the season that the actual BBC are doing, the documentaries, the TV and radio retrospectives, 
And, you know, I've been helping to make one of them, the BBC Two documentary on the first 50 years of the Beeb. I was researcher on that for uh, a month or two. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that one turns out. That'll be amazing and joyous, certainly from what I've seen. I've also actually been helping out behind the scenes uh, a tiny bit with some pointers for a Radio 3 uh, concert with the BBC Philharmonic. That harks back 100 years. That should be on in the autumn as well. And I should be cropping up in person on at least one BBC TV show talking about the century of religious broadcasting. Yes, no prizes for guessing what uh, familiar TV show that may be. Um, so after November, you know, I'm thinking we'd a little roundup of, of centenary celebrations would be quite nice. Uh, if you'd like to be part of that, get in touch. I might do a little uh, Zoom conference call and we can record it and have a little review of what's been going on and uh, bring you some familiar voices from the podcast, I'm sure. Then, of course, it'd be December, which means time for a Christmas special. Uh, for that, I'm thinking maybe I'll do you uh, the brief history of religious broadcasts in a nutshell. Might do that because it's Christmas. And then that brings us to January. And that, I think, is when we'll get back to our timeline of February 1923. The bit-by-bit -bit account of British Broadcasting's backstory with the first Welsh station, the first Shakespeare, Savoy Hill. That's the plan. But email me. Tell me otherwise. Tweet me. Find us at BB Century on Facebook and on Twitter. And let me know what you want to hear on the podcast. And I will aim to please. But that, in any case, is the plan. Apologies, by the way, if I've interviewed you and you've not heard yourself on the podcast yet. I've got a backlog of at least a dozen guests I've interviewed and just not had a chance to put out yet. But I had a great chat uh, last week with Johnny Beerling, ex-Radio 1 boss. Oh, what tales he has across his many decades working at the Beeb, including being the first producer on Radio 1. He produced Tony Blackburn's first show and then uh, led Radio 1 in the in the 90s and Radio 1 Roadshow, all of that stuff. Great to hear that from Johnny Beerling. So apologies if you're a guest and I've interviewed you. Your day is coming probably next year. But thank you. Gold. I've got gold waiting to bring it to you. Let's get the centenary out of the way first, though, shall we? Thank you for listening. If you like us, tell people, do share. This is a one-man operation. It's not made by the BBC. It's not commissioned by them or made in any way with their knowledge, whereabouts or help, apart from the Archive Centre, who have been brilliant, but that's because I've asked them. Follow us on social media. Do support us on Patreon, if you would like, as well. Patreon.com slash Paul Carenza. You get behind-the-scenes videos and extra things. And um, look, I've not asked this much, but if you've got any work send it my way. I'm a professional writer. That's my trade, right? I'm a sitcom writer and I write books. But as you can tell, I love this project. I have I would gladly spend the rest of my days just doing this if I could uh, afford to. Uh, so if you are making programs for radio and TV and you think, huh, this Paul Carenza guy with the stories of British broadcasting, we could turn it into something. Get in touch. I am available and hopefully affordable, and I will gladly turn any of this podcast and its stories into a proper program if somebody asks. But for now, the podcast continues. The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Original music is by Will Farmer. Archive clips are public domain because they're so old, but any that are the BBCs are the BBCs. Stay informed, educated and entertained. And join us next time for the museum curators and exhibitionists. If that's the right word, it's not the right word. Here, as we approach the centenary, the British Broadcasting Century.